You're listening to Eye of the Storm podcast. And if we accept that logic of the lesser evil, we're doomed. We're doomed as a, human, as a species. When, when there's a sense of emptiness and lack, that, that vacuum, if you like, get, gets filled by the toxic values of our culture and you end up chasing things which are never going to make you happy, but induce a series of kind of addictive behaviors. You could hear the fear in their voice and they would say, uh, I'm sorry, sir, but I cannot help you. If you need to look into this further, call this number. We're in a situation where the, the short-term incentives of individual actors, whether we're talking about corporations or, or nation states, are misaligned with the interests of everyone in the longer term. That is why some of us are socialists who do not believe that democracy is possible unless it penetrates the workplace, unless we have one share, one person, one vote. And believe me, Raul, they hate that. They do not want you to be free. <laughs> this podcast accompanies the acclaimed new docu-series In the Eye of the Storm, which follows the remarkable journey of maverick economist, politician and whistleblower Yanis Varoufakis. Both the series and podcast explore the connections between power, democracy, capitalism and the deepening crises of civilization. The series is available to watch now. Details in the description. Enjoy the conversation. So look, to begin, maybe I'll say a few words about why I asked you to do this podcast, what the whole idea behind it is, and, and we can jump right in. Um, so for me, you know, I've been working on a documentary series on you, and that series covers your political journey, uh, how you've been grappling with some of the biggest challenges of our time, from the crises of capitalism, democracy, inequality, uh, climate change, the rise of fascism. And this series, by the time we this episode goes out, will be available to the public. Um, so the idea of the podcast is, it's really an excuse to explore more deeply some of the themes in the series uh, by putting you together with some incredible guests. But I thought it made sense that for our first episode, uh, we would just have a conversation between you and me, um, marking pretty much a five-year anniversary uh, of, of this project. I mean, I think I got in touch with you about five years ago. Um, so my first question to you is, do you remember what your initial thoughts were when I approached you with the idea of this project? Because I imagine that having a stranger set out an idea to come and tell your story, um, that, might, that must sort of invoke some feelings of hesitancy or, or, or caution. Um, do you remember how you felt at the time? I was... Um... I was deeply honored to begin with that, um, you know, you should, you should choose me of all people to dedicate, dedicate uh, so much time and energy. Um, I was worried that um, because of the historical accident of 2015 and uh, the fact that I was, I was propelled to a limelight which uh, had nothing to do with my substance, and everything to do with the historical moment in time, an accident of history, that maybe all that attention uh, was um, misplaced. Uh, and what did I have to add to, <laughs> um, you know, to, to, to the whole gamut of insights that uh, you could have uh, gathered from elsewhere? Uh, it was only when we started talking in front of your camera at the uh, Megaron building where you hired that um, dark room in which we were cooped up for so long. It was only there that um, I, I, I started opening up and uh, it was your questions taking me back a long time and making connections which I would not have thought of making myself that I felt, well, maybe there is a story here to be told. Yeah, I remember. I remember those those days in, in the dark room in in Athens. Um, it was quite intense. We did three to four hours a day for I think six consecutive days. How was that experience on your side? You know, when when you're waging a war, because that's what we are involved in. The, you know, the powers that be, remarkably powerful forces, 
that are usurping people's lives and uh, uh, you know condemning our collectivity to a substandard way of life. Uh, when you're waging this war from a position of weakness in particular, uh, it's all systems go and it's, you always live for the moment. You have no privileges and luxuries in terms of uh, reflection. <laughs> reflection becomes a luxury that you can't afford. Uh, so, you know, being cooped up in, the, in that darkened room with you, um, taking our time and uh, answering questions about uh, a long, uh, you know, disappeared past, bringing them up to date, informing the past with uh, insights from the, from the present and vice versa. I was great. So I really enjoyed that. And I owe you a great debt of gratitude, not so much for the outcome, for the, uh, the, the documentary, that of course as well, but primarily for giving me the time and the space in order to reflect in that way. And I have to tell you, you probably don't know that, I'm sure you don't know that, that it has changed uh, the way I have been thinking about myself. <laughs> um, so to, to, to give you a concrete example, after I finished my book on techno-feudalism, um, our conversations made me think of uh, um, figures that are no longer with us, with me, um, starting, of course, with my father, but also my mother, and my grandmothers, uh, one of which I never met, but which has had a profound influence on me through my parents. So the outcome of that is that I'm writing a book which is uh, autobiographical without me being in it. That's, you know, but in, in, I don't know what, whether that book will be any good, whether I will manage to finish it, whether, whether I will manage to convince any decent publisher to, to publish it, but it doesn't matter because working on it is a great source of joy for me and insight. So I have you to thank or to blame for it. <laughs> well, look, that, that's an honor and it's a lovely thing to hear. Uh, thank you. I, I, I cannot wait to read, to read the, the end product. Um, but I wanted to go back to, I mean, you've been a leading economist and political analyst now for a few decades. And I'm just curious how, what's your approach to making sense of the world, this ever-changing um, complex reality? Okay. The way I approach um, the world is a combination of uh, the dialectical, the inquisitive, and the holistic. So it, on the one hand, it needs to be holistic. So any attempt to understand the world through economics, economic theory, is bound to crash onto the shoals of reality. Um, so holistic is the approach. Uh, the dialectical, in the sense that um, everything is pregnant with its opposite, as uh, Hegel taught Karl Marx, and as you know, my parents taught me, uh, that um, as you are confronting the powers of evil, <laughs> uh, there is good in that confrontation and also there is evil in the forces that supposedly are pursuing the good. That's why most revolutions have ended up eating up their children and every uh, freedom fighter has had a, ch a chance, has had a, a tendency to become authoritarian at some point in the peace. Uh, so the holistic and the dialectical go on hand in hand, but primarily it's curiosity, inquisitiveness, mm -hmm. you know, not to take things for granted. So, you know, keep analyzing, never lose the power of synthesis, that's the holistic part, and always beware of black and white tales about progress, about change, uh, because there is a lot of white in the black and a lot of black in the white. And, and specifically on economics, I know that the traditional education in economics is very narrow. It's going to be neoclassical economics presented as 
simply economics, but that leaves so much out. How much of your economic understanding is a result of your own self-education and investigation and how much came from your formal education? Very little came from my formal education. <laughs> and I think that that is the case for most people. Formal education is important because primarily it gives you the space and the time to think about things. So the greatest um, benefit of going to university, for instance, in my case, was not what I was ta taught by, by my lecturers. That, that was a minuscule contribution to my own understanding. It was the fact that you know, when you're at university, especially back then when most students didn't have a full-time job, effectively they were granted by society, by their municipalities, uh, the local counties and so on, uh, enough income to be able to uh, spend some time thinking and discussing and reading widely. So that was what my formal education gave me. Uh, but it was my engagement with activists, with artists, with uh, poets, with, uh, uh, with trade unionists, uh, with people on the ground, which uh, allowed me, in that space that formal education created, shielding me from uh, the vagaries of the labor market, the fact that I didn't have to work 10 hours a day, and therefore I had time to think. It was that, that space um, inhabited by uh, all those uh, stimuli from different people from different walks of life. That totality was what contributed most to the way I understood the world. In 2014, you made this transition from long-time academic to politician, or you began the transition. Um, I'm curious to know if the experience of working in politics for the last, how many years it's been now, I suppose a decade, um, has that changed your political understanding, your outlook, um, your view of democracy and, and power and that sort of thing? This may sound uh, preposterous, but... Um... I don't think I learned anything from my experience in uh, the corridors of power, in the rooms in which decisions are being made. Um, I learned a lot about backstabbing. <laughs> I learned a lot about how dismal politics is. Uh, I always knew that it was, but it's one thing to know. It's quite another to experience it. Uh, I learned a lot about treachery amongst your comrades. Uh, I was impressed by the extent of the inanity of the technocrats that supposedly are good as technocrats, uh, technically speaking. They were not. They were very third rate. I always knew they were not spectacularly good, but I wasn't expecting them to be that bad. Technically, you know, by their own, the terms of their own profession. So, you know, people from the International Monetary Fund or the European Central Bank. Uh, if they were students of mine at university, they would probably have failed them. Uh, they were particularly chronic. Um, I always suspected that, but it was good to confirm it and a bit disheartening to find out how bad they were. Um, mm -hmm. But the ugliness of politics, especially within your own circle, the circle of comrades, uh, because, Raul, I did explain this to you in, during the documentary, but I'll say this once more. You know, when I was doing battle with the late, now late, Wolfgang Schäuble or with Mario Draghi, um, it was um, hard, it was extremely tiring, but it was also uplifting because, you know, there was the enemy, the enemy of your people, who were trying to exact a pound of flesh from the uh, people who could least afford to give it. <laughs> but it was a, an honorable fight. It was within our own circle, back in Athens, amongst comrades, you know, the fifth column. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn in Britain knows this very well. His problem was not the Tories. The people in his own shadow ca cabinet were the ones wielding the knives. Similar here with us. Um, I, knew, I always knew that that was the case, but I didn't expect it to be that, that fierce. And also, after I left the government, and I left the governing party, I was astounded by uh, the sight of people that I considered to be of my ilk, to be, you know, just as I, I was, uh, committed to the cause, how quickly they forgot about the cause and they were lured by 
the semblance of power to stay within the government and you know look at me as a scans as somebody who was strange for uh, having quit um, and even in our own party merit 25 and dim 25 i have to say uh, the fact that people whom i had assumed could only be there because they were ideologues ended up mm. proving that um, the lure of power is exceptionally strong <laughs> or the the lure of something resembling power which isn't even power which is even worse because, you know, if Judas uh, betrays you for 30 pieces of silver, well, it might as well be so if the silver is genuine and not fake. But when they do it for fake silver, mm. that is more surprising and disheartening. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one of, that's one of the things that makes your story so fascinating, is it is very rare to find people who don't succumb to the kind of gravitational force of, of power and manage, you know, at, at those key moments to hold on to their integrity and, and to say no, as you did to the, to the Troika. Um, you have told me uh, personally and also in the series some fascinating stories about the personal cost of, of standing up to powerful interests. Um, so, you know, we can leave the stories in the series for people to go and find out about. But there was one which you told me after we finished filming. Um, and I wanted to ask if you'd mind talking about it here. And it was to do with your support for Julian Assange and how that ended up <laughs> costing you literally, financially. Um, I think it's a fascinating story and something that I think a lot of people would be surprised by. What happened was uh, access to our bank accounts, mine and my wife's, uh, uh, was suspended without us being told. You know, it's a, you know, you go to the ATM and uh, um, the card uh, is spat out, and you don't even get an explanation. And when I was calling the bank uh, initially, you know, the helpline, the uh, the person on the other side of the phone line. Be extremely polite. Oh, Mr. Varfakis, you are one of our, of our valued customers, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, don't worry, we'll sort out the problem in a jiffy. That kind of thing. Very, very pleasant and very positive. Until suddenly their voice changed. Clearly, they saw something on their screen and they went absolutely cold. You could hear the fear in their voice, and they would say, uh, I'm sorry, sir, but I cannot help you. If you need to look into this further, call this number. So I jolted down the number and I called the number and there was a, a telephone service, an answering service. And it said, for the reasons of national security, your account has been suspended indefinitely and you will not be told why and you have no access to um, appeal. That, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And then you think, right, they know no bounds to the exercise of illegitimate power. Uh, they don't even give you a chance to find out why or what can you do. Uh, they just cut you out and this is a statement of power on their behalf that, you know, we can do whatever we want with you. Uh, and it's very easy to terrorize people. You know? um, and it's very easy to lure them into the other side of the, to their camp, to the other side of the war, of the battle. Uh, the trick is to be privileged enough, <laughs> because I consider myself to be very privileged, in the sense that I did happen to have some money um, completely accidentally um, in another bank account that tied us over for a few weeks until we could see what happened. And also the great privilege of not wanting anything. <laughs> this sounds almost Buddhist or, <laughs> uh, or stoic. But um, mm. after I left the government, I didn't want another government position. I didn't care about being a member of parliament. I didn't care about being anything. I mean, I was happy doing nothing, doing nothing, you know, being in, at home and writing a book, even if I didn't have a computer. I mean, as long as I had access to pen and paper, I was happy. Um, so if then they, they can't get you. If, if you don't depend for your living on uh, being subservient, on towing the line, uh, then you're free. And mm. believe me, Raul, 
They hate that. They do not want you to be free. <laughs> I think that's I think that's a really important point about why going from the level of individual activists all the way to people who make it into the political realm as politicians, advisors, that a lot of people do start out with a, a sincere desire to improve things, to, to change the world. But I think too much emphasis is put on the externals initially. I think there's a dialectic between external change and internal change. And that unless we are sort of trying to cultivate a healing, a development, a, a, a sort of a sense of wisdom internally, we're going to be very susceptible to all the traps and trappings and temptations laid out for us externally. Absolutely. Uh, but then again, it's important not to pontificate, uh, not to lecture people who are not privileged like I am. I'm middle mm. class. I am privileged. I don't need to work uh, for Deliveroo or for Uber. Or, uh, you know, I, I don't have kids that depend on me uh, and, uh, and on, on being a yes man for them to go to university. Um, if I did, then maybe I would have been far less brave than I am. So I'm the last to uh, criticize those who, um, you know, are less free than I am. Because freedom is not, I mean, it, 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 part, partly it is uh, within us, ourselves, within our own spirit. But a large part of it mm. has to do with alternatives. What alternative do I have to that which is being offered to me by the mafia, by the state, by the NSA, by the CIA, by my political party, by whomever? Uh, if the alternative is starvation or my children not going to school, then I have no alternative. Then I am a slave. But that's why I'm saying I'm privileged. I had alternatives. That's true. But there are many, many privileged people who, who nevertheless do succumb to various forms of temptation, um, the promise of, of, of high status positions, wealth, the illusion of power. As you say, it's often not real power. Um, so you're absolutely right to highlight the material dimension, but that's never sufficient, is it? There's, there's always something else needed. Um, do you feel that your father's example is part of the reason that you were able to to walk away and, and take what is quite an unusual path from power? My mother and my father, both of them. You see, when I was growing up in the middle of the fascist dictatorship and then the 1970s, the late 1970s, just before I came to England in 1978, our family was uh, not well off. My parents were struggling financially. They were not paupers. They were lower middle class. Managing to make ends meet, and then at some point after 1974, uh, making a decent life, a decent living, nothing fancy, but enough to, to, to live reasonably well. That family while they were on the verge between a comfortable and an uncomfortable material life, they managed to extract a huge amount of joy out of life. I had a fantastic childhood. Uh, and as a teenager, we, I, all I remember is you know, fun and games and good feelings in very difficult times. <laughs> Even when you know, my father was in prison or my mother's brother was in prison and on death row, to be precise. I remember the laughter in the household. I remember that, uh, uh, you know, we, we were better off in every way, not materially, but we were better off than any of my school chums because I so happened to have gone to a very expensive private school, uh, even though my parents could never afford that, just because the owner of the school back then uh, set aside s several places for children of uh, people who had been uh, imprisoned or persecuted by the dictatorship. So I happened to be amongst ultra-rich kids, mm. and they were not having a better life than I was. 
actually, I was having a far better life than they were. That's a huge boost to one's uh, confidence and, to, uh, and, and a major contributor to having a, a philosophical approach to life that, you know, money can't buy you love. When, when Lennon <laughs> and the Beatles were singing that, it made perfect sense to me because I could see my, 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 my school friends who were, you know, rich kids exuded a loneliness, <laughs> which I didn't feel. Mm. Um, I mean, I can relate to that myself. I've been very fortunate to have a very happy family life. Um, and I think it makes all the difference when, when there's a sense of emptiness and lack, you, you end up that, that vacuum, if you like, get, gets filled by the toxic values of our culture and you end up chasing things which are never going to make you happy, but induce a series of kind of addictive behaviors for power, for wealth for for attention uh, all kinds of things um i wanted to just take a step back and and ask i mean you've made this transition now into the world of politics this is pretty much what it has been for the last decade um almost exclusively what you've been working on um endless zoom meetings campaigns elections do you ever regret making that choice in some sense, would it have been easier for you, more pleasurable for you to live the life of an academic, traveling, talking about your ideas, studying? Is that something that you found difficult to leave? Uh, there is no doubt that I miss the anonymity, that I'm, I have wasted a large chunk of my energy and time fending off uh, um, seriously toxic and poisonous attacks that I could easily have lived without. But, you know, Raul, it's, again, it's a, it's, it's a philosophical stance. I never regret what I've done. Um, I regret particular choices, not, but not that large choice. Because, you see, I mean, from 2003 to 2005 onwards, uh, I started p participating in the public discourse about what I had considered back then to be the forthcoming tsunami of the financial crisis. And uh, I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't felt that a new 1929 was approaching. I started feeling that in 2003. Up until then, I was perfectly happy to be completely cooped up in my own office at the university, whichever university I happened to be at, uh, to work on esoteric models, like, you know, playing chess, for instance, you know, <laughs> that kind of game theoretical stuff, which is great fun but socially irrelevant and historically irrelevant. Uh, so from 2003 onwards, I began opening my mouth, commenting on the world around me and getting angry with um, the inane reaction of the elites to what I consider to be an inevitable massive crisis of capitalism that would destroy the, the life of millions, if not billions. So once you start getting into that groove, and you start speaking out as to you know what shouldn't have shouldn't have been done and what should have happened instead, and then at some point you get an opportunity to do it yourself. You know, a politician comes to you and says, "Okay, I agree with what you're saying. Come and do it." Well, I would never have forgiven myself had I said no to that opportunity. I knew that the chances of success were minuscule. I knew that I would be ejected by a system that would never accept somebody like me trying to tamper with it, to tamper with its capacity to uh, extract huge rents and incomes and wealth from the many. But I would, I would be damned if I didn't give it a shot. And I'm glad I gave it a shot. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that I nav navigated reasonably well the... Um, the minefield of uh, traps and, uh, you know, uh, offers of threats and so on that could have caused me to, uh, to steer in a manner that I would have regretted. I didn't steer in a manner that I regretted in the end. Uh, I resigned uh, at the right moment. That was my great, 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 you know, concern. Would I resign at the right moment? Neither too early nor too late. Neither to, you know, lay down my arms before 
the chance of victory had disappeared, nor essentially to become compromised uh, with my weapons, but not using them on behalf of those that I raised them uh, in favor of initially. So, no, no regrets. Good. <laughs> Good to hear. Um, <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, it I don't know if you would frame it this way, but it seems that sometimes we have a choice between sort of pleasure and meaning. And it can be tempting to choose a path of pleasure and that it, 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 it's more enjoyable in the short term. It's 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 easier you're, you're attacked less um you're praised for what you're doing but at some at some level you know that it, it lacks meaning there's less meaning to what you're doing and the path of meaning um affords a deeper sense of well-being than than pleasure ever can well you see i think that the ancient athenians had it right it's all about mm. eudaimonia the greek word for a mm. successful life which to them was the only way you can achieve pleasure. The idea of pleasure comes in different depths and scales and scopes. So you can, you know, you, 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 you scratch your head when it's itchy and you feel it, a kind of pleasure. But then, of course, there are much, much deeper pleasures. And, you know, the ancients, the ancient Athenians believe that um, the deepest pleasure, the most powerful pleasure that you can have, uh, is combined with virtue, with you know, with doing something that is good. Aristotle had this idea uh, that um, money making can never be pleasurable; that you may be drawn to it, you may you know, enjoy making more money, but it will never fulfill you. Whereas building a boat—that's the example he gave. Building a boat is pleasurable because it has a telos, where telos means an end. So you know when the boat has been built, because you can see it floating. You can just jump in it and you know go for a, a little sail. Uh, and anything that has a telos, that's where the word teleology comes from, uh, a, a beginning, a middle, an end, a creative endeavor, is by nature virtuous. And if you do it, <laughs> if you build that boat, then the pleasure you will get will be much, much greater than the pleasure of simply of sailing in a boat. It's because you built it and because you saw it all the way to its telos, to its end. And that is a pleasure that is much deeper than scratching your head or simply, you know, you know winning 10,000 quid in a lottery. Uh, so I, I think that's what your question is all about deep pleasure that can only come from virtuous deeds and virtuous deeds must be creative deeds and making money cannot be a creative deed since money is only a means to an end not an end in itself and if it comes an end in itself it destroys your soul simply to make it right and when you multiply these incentives, these perverse sort of narrow selfish incentives um, for monetary gain, for fame, for status across a population of 8 billion people, we end up with the existential crises that we're facing now as a civilization. And one question I've, I've been grappling with myself recently is how is it that we are collectively creating a future that none of us really want? Um, we are heading very likely to some kind of collapse of civilization and possibly worse. How do you make sense of this situation, this, this sort of imperative to self-termination um, without anyone at the rudder, without anyone seeming to be in control? This is the, the great game, isn't it? The combination of self-realization uh, and uh, a process where the deeds of each one of us towards their self-realization is in the interests of the common good. Now, Adam Smith made a name for himself as the great propagandist of capitalism, of free markets. 
by putting forward the preposterous and fascinating and very heretical view back then that uh, we don't have to worry about the common good as long as we have moral sentiments in a society of bakers, brewers, and butchers, uh, where we're all bound together by a sense of community, competition between the different butchers and brewers and bakers, each one of them seeking their own self-interest, to serve their own self-interest, that will automatically create the good society, the common good. Well, maybe it would have done if we all lived in small villages in the southwest of England, and we were all bakers, brewers, and butchers. Uh, but that's not capitalism. <laughs> capitalism is the Exxon Mobiles and the Googles and the you know, Ford Motor com Companies and uh, the Aramcos and Facebook and Meta and all that. And when they are competing with one another, it's not competition uh, on price or on quality. It is a rivalry between what I say in my latest book, uh, techno-feudal lords. It's the Middle Ages made far, far worse by digital technolo technologies, which have a capacity to liberate us. But when they are deployed in the context of this new form of feudalism, techno-feudalism, they become our greatest foes, the greatest detractors of our liberty and our democracy. And then uh, you have neither self-realization nor the serving of the common good. And that's where we are today. So even the liberals who supposedly care about the liberal individual and Adam Smith should um, join forces with us to um, reclaim uh, our means of production, our means of distribution, our means of communication, our means of determining our behavior from the very, very few who have property rights over them. Is a useful frame for trying to understand this, trying to understand why we're in this bind, game theory, in the sense that we're in a situation where the, the short-term incentives of individual actors, whether we're talking about corporations or, or nation states, are misaligned with the interests of everyone in the longer term. And it's this challenge of trying to break out of that trap so we're able to cooperate to advance everyone's interests. Because the, 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 the rivalrous game of short-term interests for maximal personal gain or gain of a corporation or nation is simply heading to self-destruction. Um, does that make sense to you? And, and if so, how do we break out of the rivalrous game to the cooperative dynamic all theories are useful as long as we use them in order to explore those theories limits so game theory like every other theory does throw some very interesting insights the prisoner's dilemma is what you just described so this the story i won't narrate it in terms of prisoners because it's not much fun you go to a concert <laughs> um, and you have a choice. Each one of us has a choice. It's an open air concert on grass. We can all sit down and watch in comfort the band playing. Uh, and the question is, do you stand or do you sit? If everybody's sat, everybody would have a far more comfortable gig and they would have the same view because we're all sitting down. But the problem here and the conundrum is that if everybody else is sitting, sitting down, you're better off standing up because you have a much better view than everybody else. But then if that is the case for you, then it is the case for everyone else. So everybody stands and everybody gets tired and nobody has, gets a better view. So this is the, the clash between the private and the collective interest. Maximizing your uh, utility, you know, doing that which is best for you in that situation uh, ends up with everybody being worse off, including yourself. Now, the moment you've said that, you realize that this pertains, as you implied in your question, Ro, to our environmental catastrophe. Because it would be fantastic, would it not be, if everybody else cut down their emissions to zero, and we didn't have to, and you and I didn't have to, because if you and I you know, continue to emit without worrying about uh, 
the climate catastrophe, but everybody else around the world uh, looked after the planet, then it would matter. You and me emitting, you know, having a, a 1960s Cadillac emitting huge quantities of carbon dioxide and other noxious gases in the atmosphere, it wouldn't matter. One Cadillac wouldn't make a difference. The world would be saved. So, uh, my dominant strategy, if you think in those terms, in those economic, neoclassical terms, my dominant strategy is to emit, because yes, I would prefer a world in which nobody em emits to one where everybody emits. But I have a dominant strategy that is a strategy which I am best off following independently of what others do. So if everybody else emits, why shouldn't I emit? The world is fucked anyway. Excuse my French. Uh, uh, and if everybody else doesn't emit, well, I might as well emit because it doesn't make any difference. But if everybody thinks that way, we all emit and the world is doomed. That is an interesting insight from game theory. Uh, okay, but that's the limit of it. If you try to uh, use game theory uh, as a source of insights uh, concerning what needs to be done, then you will end up with nothing because no theoretical construct is a substitute for democracy, for debating, for the conversation that would lead to collective action. Because the only way we can all decide in the end not to drive around the Cadillacs and instead to abstain from a meeting is if we have a conversation that creates the political institutions that will put an end to emissions. Mm. So that's it. So the only way out of these sort of multi-agent traps, if you like, is collective action, is to find a way to act together for the benefit of all. And central to that is the sense-making process yes. that we're Indeed. able to make sense of reality um, in a way that allows us to communicate with each other. Of course, we're not going to have identical views, but if as we're seeing now, if we're incredibly polarized to the point where we can barely communicate about reality, it makes it impossible to act collectively. Um, what are your thoughts about the increasing polarization of, of our polities? Um, we see it kind of in an extreme form in the US, but I think it's happening everywhere. The extreme polarization that we observe all around us is the result of the extreme concentration of capital and property rights over means of production, distribution, and communication. The, those who own the machines, uh, this immense power of capital, whether it's terrestrial capital or cloud capital, um, have every reason to use the power of that capital, especially the power of the communication machinery, in order to polarize us. You know, the, the, the policies they really care about are very unpopular. And the best way of ensuring that they are imposed is by disorienting us so that we turn against one another. So, the, you know, they are very happy to see working class people in the north of England, um, you know, uh, taking it out on migration. You know, one part of the working class against another part of the working class. That's how racism was instituted in the south, the deep south of the United States. The Jim Crow uh, legislation was all about splitting the working class between whites and blacks so that the landlords and the capitalists could stay in power. So, you know, we talked about before, in the previous question, about the conversation. I talked about it, how important the conversation is. Well, that conversation is not, cannot take place in our parliaments, mm -hmm. in Congress not even in our municipal councils. It should take place there, but it's really, it's necessary that it does, but it's not sufficient. If it doesn't take place inside the workplace, if we do not democratize the world of work where things are being made, services are being produced, and where power grows, because it doesn't grow in parliament, power grows inside the machinery of economic activity. So that is why some of us are socialists who do not believe that democracy is possible unless it penetrates the workplace, unless we have one share, one person, one vote, unless every factory 
every office, every supermarket becomes a mini parliament in which people co-own the means of production and as co-owners have the conversation amongst themselves as to what they want to produce and how they want to distribute the income that is being produced. And in, and in moving towards that world, what can we as progressives do to avoid deepening the polarization that exists? Because I, I think we need to be self-critical and I think there are, there are trends and habits on the left which contribute to this trap of, of deepening polarization in, in the forms of activism that we engage in. So how do you think about communication and healing the very deep rifts which are there? Because we, we need to bring many people along with us if we're going to achieve anything meaningful. Well, certainly we, ha we need to be self-critical, to beware the lure of power uh, within us. The little Nazi that lives in every one of us, as Wilhelm Reich used to say. But at the very same time, we need to work very hard against the logic of uh, the lesser evil. Today, there is a process in Britain, for instance, a political process which will most likely lead to a victory by Keir Starmer's Labour Party. And those of us who you know, start ring, ringing alarm bells that Keir Starmer is, is, is a Tory dressed in red or pale red, uh, we're being told that, hang on, mate, he's better than Sunak. Even this Labour Party is better than the Tory party. Well, this theory, logic of the lesser evil, is the best friend of those who use, normally use the Tories in order to perpetuate exploitation, deprivation, devastation. Because effectively what it says is, uh, there is no alternative. The tyranny of capital, of cloud capital, of the oligarchy is a given. Uh, and uh, we need to back the agents of that tyranny, which promise us a little bit more money for the National Health Service, you know, a little bit more money for the, the hungry, a few more shelters for uh, the, um, the homeless, you know, a little less brutality with which to treat the migrants and the refugees. And if we accept that logic of the lesser evil, we're doomed. We're doomed as a, human, as a species. And, and, and what would you say to people who, I think, in despair, in despair at the failures of the liberal, so-called liberal centre ground, have looked for solutions and looked for affirmation and a sense of belonging on the far right? Um, the people who have looked to Donald Trump in the US um, perhaps Farage in the UK, and across Europe we have many examples. I would say to them, look, learn from history, because this is not new. Mussolini and Hitler addressed the devastated, the middle class, the working class, the petty bourgeoisie, and said to them, trust me, give me authoritarian powers, or give your consent to my authoritarian powers, and I'm going to look after you. And indeed, they looked after them. You know, Mussolini introduced uh, the first public pension in Europe, and Hitler eliminated unemployment within a year and a half of uh, acquiring his authoritarian Nazi powers. And what happened then? They were treated like vermin. They were the working class, the middle class, were effectively surrendered to the great big capitalists that supposedly the fascists were against um, in order to maximize the profit rates of those capitalists and also created the circumstances for a world war in which they died. Donald Trump. Well, he's been tried and tested. He was president of the United States for four years. He appealed 
to the blue collar workers of the Midwest and said to them things that resonated with them, that have been treated with contempt by the Democrats and by the liberal establishment for many, many, many years or decades. He was right in this. He told them the truth. And he asked them to give him a, a vote so that he could drain the swamp. And what was the swamp? Wall Street's influence on, on Washington. And what was the first thing that Trump did when he moved into the White House? He appointed the CEO of Goldman Sachs to be the finance minister, the treasury secretary. This is what they do. They appeal to the um, anger of the devastated. Mm. They cultivate it. They make them even more angry. They promise to use and to honor this anger against the elites, against the ruling class, if only they are voted in. And the moment they are voted in, they use the misanthropy which is part and parcel of this anger, let's say the feelings against the foreigners, the refugees, the Muslims, the Jews, whatever, in order to cover up the fact that in economic terms what they are doing is they, when once these right-wing populists are in power, they are again following the agenda of the oligarchy, of the very oligarchy that they said they would drain of the swamp. <laughs> the swamp rules <laughs> okay, even better with Trump in the, White, in the White House. So, in other words, I would, if I addressed people in the Red Wall or, you know, anyone who is... Uh, uh, inclined to vote for Trump or for Brexit or for uh, Le Pen or for Orban, I would say, you know, don't be a fool. Don't be fooled by these people. These people are making you even angrier at other devastated people like the migrants in order to harness your anger, to get into power, to keep the same people who are responsible for your devastation, more powerful than ever. It's a tough call, but that's the call we have to respond to. Yanis, there are so many other things I'd love to ask you, but I, I know you have to go shortly. Um, this is only the first episode in a series, so we're going to cover many more topics. Um, but for today... Thank you very much. It, it, it's been it's been a pleasure again to talk to you, and I hope our future conversations can contribute to the sense making commons in a responsible and helpful way. Raúl, what can I say? Thank you once more. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe to our channel.